Uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Ashwini Swain. I'm a researcher at the Center for Policy Research. And um, uh, I, I'm mostly interested in electricity sector and uh, political economy of energy transition. But today we, we, we are going to think about, discuss about energy transition along, along with another transition. And I won't hesitate to call it uh, understated and overdue transition in the agriculture sector. And often when we talk about uh, energy and agriculture, we talk about how ag agriculture sort of consumes one fifth of electricity in India and how that has led to several problems. Uh, but, but the question today we are trying to understand uh, the ongoing uh, changes in the electricity sector, the changes in the nature of energy being uh, produced and the way uh, uh, energy being consumed in uh, uh, will be consumed in energy sector how that can save the agriculture and to discuss that we we have a stellar pilot panel who who bring in uh, very different perspectives but complementary perspectives uh, we have uh, dr aditi Mukherjee, who is a principal researcher at the international water management institute aditi has um, nearly two decades of work on water energy nexus in agriculture and now she's, she's, she's working on solarization of agriculture uh, and she, she, she has a large body of work but this is this is the relevant work to this discussion and the second panelist we have is ashwin gambhir who is a fellow at prayas mm -hmm. energy group and press uh, as we all know that they, they, they have been working for a long time on india's electricity sector issues including agricultural um, consumption and uh, uh, sort of the implication of that uh, th uh, in third, we have uh, Harish Damodaran, who is a senior fellow at uh, CPR, and he's also the National and uh, National Rural Affairs and Agriculture Editor at the Indian Express. So we look up to Harish uh, as someone who knows everything about rural affairs and agriculture in India. And finally, we have uh, Professor Priya Jadav, who is uh, at the Indian Institute of uh, Bombay. Uh, as part of the Center for Technology Alternatives for Rural Area. And CE has been working on rural electrification and development, organizational models for electricity distribution, as well as uh, technology and the farm behavior issues. So before before we get into the discussion, I would take uh, two, three minutes to introduce the topic of discussion and uh, sort of uh, put, put forth my views on that. Uh, <coughs> So uh, electricity uh, has been an important input to agriculture and we know in uh, through 1970s and 80s how access to electricity in farmland sort of uh, contributed to a boost in the farm sector and uh, in, the, in the green revolution period the whole ecosystem how that contributed to address India's food security, rural poverty, as well as uh, uh, overall uh, overall development in the uh, agriculture sector. And uh, after after 50 years since then, uh, the agriculture sector is sort of going to be um, not exactly re-energized, but the supply of energy is going to change. And uh, rightfully, the government of India has prioritized agriculture as part of the energy transition. And the PM Kusum scheme, as we know it, uh, is trying to promote uh, um, solarization of agricultural irrigation farms, and which is an important step if uh, we could uh, replace all the existing irrigation farms with uh, solarized all, all of them, we can achieve important uh, goals, uh, which includes a daytime reliable supply to the farm, farmlands, which has been a long-standing de demand. Uh, is the subsidy pressure in electricity distribution again a, one of one of the biggest concern in several states uh, uh, contributing to fiscal uh, state level fiscal deficit and at the same time we we can contribute to decarbonization of the electricity sector itself uh, and just to remind it accounts for one fifth of the electricity consumption and if we uh, uh, can uh, replace all the pumps with the solar pumps and we, we will probably achieve uh, a third of the 450 gigawatt target we have for 2030 but uh, is this electricity centric focus uh, on the agri agriculture um, enough or are we missing out the uh, missing out the transformative potential of uh, a transition which happens in decades 
So considering that the broad question we are trying to answer in uh, or uh, attempting to answer in this session is, could the imperatives for uh, towards decarbonization in electricity be syn uh, synergized with uh, larger developmental priorities in agriculture? And uh, at CPR, some of um, my colleagues and I think, yes, there's a potential. And that, that requires a comprehensive strategy to what we call repower agriculture. And uh, um, 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 the strategy needs to address multiple and simultaneous, <coughs> understand the linkages and address multiple and simultaneous economic, environmental, and political challenges in both the sectors between the interlinkages. And for that, we suggest three-step approach. And um, the first step we are suggesting, uh, along with this uh, solarization of uh, irrigation, we need to try, uh, we need to bundle uh, upgradation of irrigation infrastructure. So both of these uh, are part of centrally sponsored schemes. There is funding, uh, budgetary support available at the central central level as well as at the state level for these schemes. Uh, uh, we're suggesting how we can bundle that. And then the next thing to think about uh, is uh, agroclimatic zone specific crop choices, which has been a part of the policy process, not necessarily we have uh, I'm not aware of any direct schemes looking into that or supporting, uh, providing incentives for that, but uh, this is uh, certainly part of the uh, policy discourse. Then the fourth factor we're looking at is how to factor the nutritional security. Even though we have overcome the food scarcity, uh, um, have come out uh, from a massive food scarcity in 1960s to now to be net food surplus, but we also rank uh, high in terms of nutritional deficit. So while we are thinking about crop choices, how we can factor that, uh, that that nutritional security as part of the policy choices. So here the potential benefits include if we combine uh, irrigation infrastructure as well as the energy source, we are going to reduce uh, water and energy demand in agriculture. Consequently, the, re uh, uh, the requirement for investment to solarize will come down also. And simultaneously, we'll be addressing uh, nutritional security, which is as important as uh, food security, uh, which was part of uh, uh, the priority for a long time. So the, uh, the second step we are suggesting is um, if we if we solarize uh, agricultural uh, uh, irrigation uh, eventually, uh, I mean let's assume it happens over this decade, uh, we going uh, this is going to result in a huge uh, um, surplus power uh, seasonal surplus power in rural area. So how do we utilize that? Uh, without a plan for that, we probably have to put up storage infrastructure or transport it, uh, trans, uh, transport it to our nearby urban areas where it can be consumed. And uh, simultaneously, um, farm sector sort of uses labor force for uh, three to four months in a year. There is a surplus labor for another eight months in a year as well. So can we leverage that surplus power, potential surplus power, and the surplus labor to promote productive uh, uses in rural area and particularly rural enterprises or industries which can work on seasonal basis and um, the potential benefits are here multifold we i mean it sort of aligns with our national priorities to augment farm income uh, so uh, basically it supplements farm income with non-farm income rural areas and creates more employment opportunities in rural areas uh, and simultaneously, it increases rural energy demand, which is important for the electricity sector in terms of subsidy and management and other things. I won't get into the details. The third um, step, what we suggest, uh, uh, these changes, if we pursue them, there's a potential to uh, 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 introduce uh, and promote farm practices that sort of uh, leads the sector towards the resiliency, uh, promote uh, um, sort of encouraging or incentivizing minim um, to min minimize pressures on natural resources like groundwater and uh, uh, land, um, and sort of uh, addressing environmentally damaging practice practices like uh, stubble burning, which we so far think about it's Punjab and Haryana only. But um, two years back when I visited Odisha during harvest season, I not only saw the 
combined harvesters from Punjab, I also saw some fire on some farmlands. So it's spreading fast. So these are the three steps uh, uh, we are sort of suggesting how we can take a holistic approach towards uh, energy transition in uh, agriculture sector and uh, think for a more transformative outcome in agriculture. So uh, I'll stop here uh, and uh, sort of uh, with the uh, eminent panel uh, we have, uh, I'll get into the get to the panelists and uh, let me pose a few questions to the panelists. So, I mean, I, I look up to Aditi and Ashwin as sort of um, uh, backstage architects of the Kusum scheme. They're sort of uh, uh, trying to see how that can be strengthened, how that can um, can be more effective. So uh, my question is, is such a multiple benefit approach uh, viable in this particular case? And uh, if so, what are the costs and opportunities? How do we address the transaction costs? So Aditi, can I request you to comment on that? Yeah, thank you, Ashwini, and uh, thank you for the for the panel. I'm I'm really uh, looking forward to this discussion today. It's very close to my heart. Um, uh, while not being an architect of Kusum in any way, I mean, Emi had influence. Uh, but uh, what I want to say is that uh, what I really like about the Kusum is that it recognizes that a large country like India cannot have one size model fit all. So Kusum does have multiple uh, components, Kusum A, B, C, and each of those components are also, uh, there, is, there is a lot of scope for innovations within each of those components, which I think is, is, is a fantastic idea. It also takes into account to some extent the varying agroecological conditions. For instance, Kusum B, more of the standalone farms possibly would be taken up more in the water, uh, water abandoned eastern India while the grid connected components of Kusum A and C would be more uh, amenable to more of the water scarce parts of India. So I, I, I think uh, the, the very fact that we can, uh, the very fact that Kusum provides those kind of options somehow tells me that this program has been quite nicely thought through. And having said that, uh, all, the, all the benefits that you uh, provided Ashwini, I think all of them are very, very valid. To that, I particularly want to add a couple of things around the just energy transition. We don't not only require energy transition, we want that energy transition to be also just and as far as possible equitable. Uh, so if we that and if you look at the literature of just transition, we don't really have too many examples. And I was thinking the work that we are doing with the SDC grant, the solar project in Gujarat, while not saying that is the is the is the justice of them all or or any anything of that sort without making very many tall claims what we did find was that the farmers the farmers who have connected to the kusum grid and farmers who have actually understood the system quite well are earning substantial income we found farmers were earning up to 60000 to 2 lakh rupees a year from selling electricity to the grid and some of these farmers are actually in north Guj north gujarat where the groundwater crisis is very very acute so while right now we do not have evidence that they are actually saving groundwater or any of those because we haven't yet, I mean, uh, we, we, our project is hoping to collect that kind of evidence. Right now our evidence is very much anecdotal. But we are seeing that there is this alternate energy, you know, like there are these parts of India where farming would not be viable in the long run just because of climate change and the way you have overexploited groundwater resources. What opportunities do you get give farmers in those regions to exit farming with honor, you know, without destitution? And I find that this particular scheme with this with this capacity for farmers to sell back electricity to the grid so kind of could be on that way. Of course, there are many other things to be addressed. For instance, what I find perhaps lacking in Kusum is there's no, no focus on the gender equity and social inclusion aspect. So I know in many countries, I also work in Nepal. Nepal has been trying to target, uh, like, uh, you know, do a subsidy scheme by giving special subsidy to women and poor farmers, farmers whom they call from DAG groups, which is disadvantaged groups. Uh, so, so I think that kind of thing can also be included in Kusum in the future for making it more uh, more uh, amenable. So I'll, I'll stop there. But overall, I think that this does provide grid connected solar at individual level, uh, like at a farmer field actually provides that opportunity for farmers to earn income, uh, you know, from non agricultural activities. Uh, I mean, yeah, so. So back yeah. to you, Ashwin. Yeah, thanks, Aditi. Thanks for bringing up just transition and gender aspect. 
so which which are equally important and uh, I, I probably don't have an answer to the gender equity aspect but that's that's an important question we have to deal with um uh, ashwin now now coming to you uh, uh, so uh, uh, but um, what i understand is kusum hasn't quite progressed as planned i mean that, that, that there was an ambitious plan but the implementation is has taken off in few states but uh, there's there's a, a bit of state government resistance in few states and um, it seems uh, what we understand is the incentives are not adequate enough for all the stakeholders everywhere and i'm talking about all the components not necessarily one particular component so uh, um, and uh, I, I sort sort of wanted to know uh, can we sort of bundle all these uh, interventions all these opportunities uh, to better incentivize the stakeholders is there a possibility uh, so and along with your own comments on, on yeah that. yeah thanks thanks firstly for having uh, having me at this important discussion let me begin by saying firstly uh, it has been a long haul we have been pushing for the solar feeder scheme, which uh, government of Maharashtra took up in 2017 and uh, subsequently government of India has picked it up as sort of the by far the largest, uh, you know, in scale within Kusum ABC, the grid connected uh, or solar feeders, as we call it in Maharashtra, is being taken up in all states. Uh, the recent uh, uh, push under uh, this uh, package for discoms revival also places uh, feeder separation and solarization of those agriculture feeders as one as a very very important component and our <coughs> assessment has been that Maharashtra government has already uh, tendered around 3000 megawatts that covers around 25 percent of agriculture in Maharashtra uh, and this they are doing without any subsidy uh, these are small solar plants distributed and decentralized across uh, the geography of Maharashtra uh, and size to those particular needs so I think it is a very uh, important and uh, uh, once in a decade or you know even longer kind of opportunity where this problem of electricity um, of water and uh, agriculture has been long standing at least now we have a solution to one uh, piece of the puzzle that is uh, you know unsubsidized sustainable decentralized uh, solar generation which matches the needs of agriculture i am not saying this is the entire solution but let us also keep in context, we haven't been able to even provide a solution to this one piece over these decades. So at least this is significant progress. Let us not sort of, uh, you know, uh, throw the baby with the bathwater and, you know, want every perfect solution to everything. I think this is a very good step. And then coming to your point, I think... Uh, you know, if you look at the uh, minister, power ministers meeting a uh, few months ago, most states are over exceeding their quota or wanting more than what the government of India is actually allocating to them under Kusum for solar feeders. So I think there is a great alignment of incentives. Uh, there's a great alignment of social needs and political economy as well, with jobs being distributed across states and across India. Uh, so I think this is, as you said, I am very confident that uh, within the decade, you will see all of agriculture or most of agriculture solarized in this manner. And I think there are important uh, uh, parallels where you can uh, combine this transition and add in uh, more possibilities. One is, I think, uh, uh, you know, you start by building trust with the farmers, give them daytime reliable power, and you build on that. You build on that with farmer extension services to see, uh, you know, what kind of interventions you can do in crop selections, in, you know, in efficient water use, so on and so forth. But I think the starting point has to be uh, this trust building exercise. Uh, you can also, as Maharashtra government allows, use land leasing and put in money directly into the pockets of the farmers or people who own those lands uh, where the solar farms uh, solar plants will be located uh, you can also build on what selco has been doing in a long way cold storage for agriculture where you know the 50 to 60 percent of uh, the the cost of a cold storage is the energy bill and now you have a really low cost solar uh, possibility where you can you know build on the solar uh, feeders in those areas and uh, as one estimate says that around 20 percent of food or uh, you know agriculture produces wasted so cold storage can also form a very significant transformational 
educational aspect within uh, rural livelihoods and uh, you know there are other aspects like biofuels or agro photovoltaics i won't talk about everything right now but i overall i want to say this is a very very transformational possibilities and one needs to look at it that way and build on that thanks uh, thanks ashwin I, I i i sort of pick up the point uh, you mentioned we need to build the trust then only we can introduce multiple uh, uh, interventions and uh, get support from uh, different groups including the farmers uh, but but, but um, the uh, one question i had how to sequence these interventions so i, I don't think it's early to think about how do we sequence this because uh, if we end up replacing i mean on an optimistic note end up replacing all the pumps with uh, all the existing pumps uh, with solar systems then we'll be will be creating surplus there seasonal surplus how uh, that will be another problem we'll, we'll have to manage so while we are thinking about solarization of pumps we need to think about how the surplus energy can be used and simultaneously we can uh, reap other benefits also so i mean the idea is to uh, stimulate a discussion around this and uh, I'm, I'm not saying uh, we can go with multiple interventions together but we have to sequence in certain way uh, i'll now come to priya uh, who who has been working on several of these aspects and um, want to understand what's your perspective on this uh, is, is this the right time to think about it and what are the priorities we should be thinking about so um so i guess you're talking uh, generally are you asking generally about solar pv uh, in agricultural pumping or um... uh, no i'm uh, talking about how do we think about uh, uh, what can uh, we do in addition to solarization of the pumps and how can we put in complementary arrangements that creates uh, more incentive for farmers as well as uh, sort of uh, addresses the surplus energy is there an opportunity to tap here yeah so ashwini uh, so first of all i have a very different opinion from what the former two speakers have said about solar in uh, agriculture but uh, first let me talk about what you uh, the question you asked so i i think it's a very difficult thing to use this excess energy from solar off seasonal energy for other aspects because um, first of all you know things are not going to be aligned to off season for whatever it is i mean there are plenty of challenges in rural areas as is with regard to economic activities and to now align those so that you can use the excess power is difficult plus but more importantly also I just don't see how it can be done practically. If you have solar off-grid pumps, they are going to be in the field somewhere, kilometers away. And uh, how are you going to use it? Either are you going to charge a battery and bring it back? And if it's grid connected, then it doesn't really matter in one way or the other. We still have grid supply in villages. Yeah, there are issues with the grid supply, but it's still there. And I don't think that, uh, you know, I mean, there are plenty of papers out there about whether development affects electricity uh, supply or electricity supply affects development so i don't think that having i mean making that connection between off season energy and rural development seems very impractical and very difficult to me now coming back to solarization of irrigation pumps um see first of all off grid pumps are not economical considering the seasonality of irrigation in most locations then i think the other danger is that we are essentially shifting the you know from a public system the grid system we are moving it to these private systems which are very problematic for so many reasons first uh, there's still a huge subsidy component secondly you are it's a capital intensive kind of a subsidy and you are distributing it all over the countryside in these small um, you know who do, who's that going to belong to that's going to belong to the farmer but that's a huge subsidy in itself as putting it in uh, up front uh secondly off grid solar pumps become very uh, rigid you know right now farmers conditions keep changing they want a different pump they've dug a new well the well has gone dead they want a new well so uh with a solar pv pump that really constrains thing you can't uh, the pump comes with a set of electronics a set of pv panels changing that pump for a new condition is not easy so that's another problem and uh, as for grid connected uh, you know um, the net metered pumps or the solar ag uh, 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 feeders um, 
solar energy feeders may be a good sort of institutional slash organizational thing because it is a plus point for governments to say that we are providing solar uh, energy to farmers whether or not it really needs to be a solar energy feeder or not i mean these uh, plants could very well be uh, you know 50 megawatt utility scale grid supply plants which connect to the grid system and you give daytime supply to farmers right now also the problem is that if you are only going to solarize a few solar feeders i don't see how politically the utility is going to be able to supply daytime supply to some feeders and not to others so that's a problem i mean i think daytime supply is a very important thing and i think solar power connected to the grid is also a good thing all around um however there is the there are these issues with solar energy feeders that i see and uh, as for net metered grid connected pumps uh, you know you're just adding to the cost of the system here you have a pump which is already connected to the grid by adding a solar pv panel there you're making it more expensive again there's a cost a uh, uh, question of who the investment is coming from and as for farmers getting money back from that investment it's not you know the problem with that investment is you're not building the farmer's capacity in any way it's like giving him an account from which he's getting an interest and i see a problem in that i mean if we are to spend money we should be spending it in building their capacities so uh, so in general i'm all for solar and i'm all for daytime supply to farmers but i see these issues uh, thanks thanks priya thanks for raising those important questions i certainly agree with the question you pointed about um, um how, how to uh, um how to address the political concern if we start providing data and supply in certain feeders how do we manage the other political constituencies that's an important question and i i don't have an answer to that but the couple of points you touched upon i want wanted to respond to that uh, one is uh, off grid versus grid connected pumps or solar feeders so i think it's sort of getting clearer that the way to go is more grid, grid interactive systems be it feeders or pumps and even the government policies are getting aligned to that uh, reality uh, and eventually um, off grid pumps will become um, rare or that will sort of slow down the uh, other thing uh, the uh, one uh, one other question you raised about uh, how it will be difficult to align uh, non farm activities using the farmlands uh, uh, farm surplus power my reaction to that is our thought is that one immediate thing that comes into mind is uh, agro processing units be it storage uh, be it uh, some degree of processing uh, 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 set up in rural areas which which can use this um, uh, surplus electricity in eight months of the year when the harvest is over um, can we utilize that that's that's a question and with that uh, now that harris is online uh, uh, i i pass on uh, pass it on to him is it a, i mean if you missed uh, the uh, part of the discussion let me um, uh, reiterate that we are thinking about um, if we solarize the farmland one of the points we're thinking about if we solarize the farmland we are going to have uh, surplus power in rural areas which will be available for eight uh, of non farm season eight months of non farm uh, season and we also have surplus labor can we build on this surplus power and uh, um, labor to promote rural enterprises industries which can uh, augment uh, or supplement farm income and create uh, li livelihood opportunities hari uh, over to you yeah uh, uh, let me be frank uh, ashwini i've met farmers and most of them use 5 hp uh, uh, pumps okay i haven't seen very big uh, pumps and all so i I'm, I'm i'm basing it on what i've seen on the field and and interacting with the farmers okay uh, i don't think it can go beyond that see 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 the the, the main problem is uh, see uh, if you if you if you look at uh, 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 typically say say uh, uh, in the case of uh, motors see you you either you say 3 inch bore pipes you know 6 inch bore pipes you know and uh, most of the ones which i have seen the pumps which i have used have seen is all this 3 inch bore kind of thing you know and and uh, maybe maybe 5 hp is the kind of uh, 
power which they can which they can use you know and uh, probably these are more well suited for areas which actually have enough water you know enough water tables like like uh, like uh, eastern up bihar and 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 these kind of places and there today i think especially with the kind of diesel prices today which you have i mean it's a it's a no brainer i mean you 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 look at it like i mean you 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 look at simple economics you know say see it takes about say 5 hours to irrigate 1 acre okay and in 1 hour you may burn about say 1.25 to say 1.5 liters of diesel and today at 90 rupees you know it means it's something like about 600 rupees per irrigation okay and uh, take say for example paddy paddy you need minimum say 5 5 irrigation even in a normal irrigation year so 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 600 into 5 you know so that is say 3000 rupees per acre okay and uh, say if i am a 10 acre farmer it is straight away 30000 rupees right and uh, if it is say two crops it might be say 50000 rupees okay and uh, today with i think this uh, 5 hp solar pump i mean from what i know it's about what 2.5 uh, uh, lakh rupees uh, something 2.5 2.6 is what 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 i've, I've been uh, uh, seeing and plus with with all the subsidy and all i think 90% and all so the the payback is just one year you know and uh, i would suppose the same is the case even with even with uh, with with electric pump you know because uh, i think i think uh, uh, again you you look at it i mean i i i think i think minimum now in in up now i think they are they are charging something like uh, 150 rupees per month per hp you know and i think they are saying minimum and and they are billing the, the default billing is for about 10 hp so which means uh, every month uh, minimum is say 1500 so 1500 into you know 12 so that is about the thing so so maybe in the case of electricity the payback maybe you know from from using solar maybe about say for 3 uh, years 4 years etc so i think we should allow this thing to stabilize let farmers get used to it you know and uh, let us not look beyond 5 hp 7.5 hp and you know things like you know surplus power and all i think i think it's it's too far down the line we now have about what about 4 lakh uh, uh, pumps right on the field okay maybe the next stage could be you know for uh, 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 say cold stores right you can you can run cold stores in the in 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 the farm but i think agro processing and all is uh, is is uh, too much down the line you know it is better we we we, we stick to basic farming L- let us go into the say i am not very sure about all this uh, grid uh, whatever supply surplus power and all all these kind of things let us first free the farmer from the grid you know if it is possible you know especially given the fact the way diesel is you know let us look at as let, let us look at solar as an alternative to diesel you know and yeah. and and it is possible in irrigation you know but uh, i think electricity has to be there we need three phase electricity you cannot do all these uh, uh, things without without i think electricity power so so i i think i think this itself is a is a very big distance travel you know uh, 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 re- replacing i mean using it for for irrigation in places where the water table is reasonably high you know especially in eastern india and all 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 these places you know uh, uh, so so 5 hp pumps you know let it, let it stabilize let the let the technology stabilize even our diesel and electric pumps and all took you know decades to stabilize you know let us uh, uh, this thing and let's not set too many targets on 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 the poor farmer you know the farmer already as it is you know he, he has to take care of our food security then then his his sons have to go and guard our borders okay national security then then he has to look after our even bhartiya sanskriti you know the, uh, he, he cannot uh, send cows for slaughter and all these things then now he has to send his his sons and daughters for for olympics you know and then he has to be a climate warrior let's not put too many too much burden on the farmer let us look at agriculture as by, by itself you know and this is a good start you know let us uh, i mean if he is able to irrigate his field you know without using diesel you know i, I think yeah. i think that itself is very good and an area with good water table you know and along with if you have farm ponds etc where you are able to store water you know uh, 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 rain water and all i think it's yeah. a, it's a fantastic combination so let us not look into processing and all these things right now i mean this is my i'm i'm talking as a lay reporter i'm not talking as a as an expert yeah thanks uh, thanks 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 haris uh, that, that's uh, that's helpful but um, uh, what i wonder is uh, we at least have to think about it i mean the fact that we th- start thinking about it it doesn't happen it takes years i mean and we cannot wait for 10 years to 
only replace the pumps and then get back to the uh, other how do we address other issues and that sort of let's me think about one other concern if we start uh, replacing just the energy source for irrigation are we creating enough incentives for water stressed areas and which is which is a big concern and uh, aditi has been thinking about this for long so um, yeah aditi over to you i mean how do we uh, sort of embed that into it i mean i i, I uh, understand the sky scheme is trying to provide additional income to farmers which is a great thing and the just thing to do but uh, is it creating enough incentive to reduce the stress on groundwater and how do we bring yes, in yeah. that yes uh, uh, no I, I i want to react to some of the things also very very interesting things that priya as well as ashwin said um, uh, i do think that the sky can potentially or schemes like sky can potentially if done right so a lot of uh, you know a lot of uh, qualifiers there if done right, can actually incentivize more efficient groundwater use. Uh, unfortunately, very often because these schemes have a high capital cost or because these are absolutely new, sometimes perhaps the governments are trying to make them as acceptable to the farmer as possible. And I, I suspect that something that may have happened with Sky. Does, uh, so what's happening is, say, in a place like um, uh, North Gujarat, where water tables are deep and farmers are actually using, you know, even... 30, 25, 30, 40 horsepower yeah. pumps. Those are huge pumps. In those kind of places, we are already seeing that farmers are reducing their pumping or at least keeping, not expanding their pumping, but they're still able to earn some income. Now I'm going to tell you something which is a bit counterintuitive. When we were first started looking at the data and we were so happy to see that farmers are selling 30 to 40 percent of their electricity back to the grid. We were tempted to jump to the conclusion that Therefore, farmers have reduced their pumping. But we kind of, when we look more carefully at the data and we compared it with the farmers who had not in the same feeder, but they hadn't opted for sky, we actually found that there is no difference in the hours of pumping between the sky feeder and the non-sky feeder farmer. Even though, uh, so, so basically what was happening, where was the farmer then getting this extra electricity to sell to the grid? Because he was seeming to be pumping just the equal amount as the counterpart who, who hadn't got a solar. When we look carefully at it, we realized the two things that happened. Number of hours of supply had gone up from 8 to 12 for the sky farmers. So they were basically getting more number of hours of electricity. And also in the process of sky, if somebody had a 10 horsepower pump, the, the panel sizes that were given was not exactly equivalent to 10 horsepower. They were actually like oversized a little, not a little bit, like up to up to 15 to 20 percent. So what we what we we think has happened is that the overall energy entitlement of a, of a solar farmer has increased, which means that but that increase they are not using it by themselves. They are actually selling it back to the grid. Now, if only the scheme architecture and we have been in discussion, and they are actually saying that now they are going to reduce the number of hours of electricity that a sky farmer gets from twelve hours to eight hours. Once so so far, farmers have been able to sell it back to the grid without having to do any adjustments to their groundwater. That is what they have been. They have been basically they just got a bit extra energy that they are putting it back to the grid. But when they actually don't get those 12 hours and they have to actually economize, my hypothesis is that many farmers, in particularly water scarce parts of, of the country, who are actually finding it difficult to grow crops with profit may choose to reduce their water use and instead uh, you know uh, produce more electricity and put it to the grid they are not doing it yet because they didn't have to make that choice the, the scheme design was such that that they didn't really have to choose between not pumping and more pumping and before that i also wanted to say that while i generally agree that basically the off-grid pumps are something most of us are discovering unlike the best of the ideas and that's also happening in Nepal and Bangladesh, where we are working with the solar project. Bangladesh, Nepal, mm. both went the off-grid way, and they're all trying to get to the grid connected. That is that is good. But in the in the Indian context, in places like West Bengal, for instance, where I've done a lot of my work, here the farmers face a really high meter tariff. And the one of the uh, meter tariffs are great. They're great for the electricity sector, right? Mm. I mean, they allow you for audit and everything. But meter tariffs have not been that great for the very small, poor, and marginal farmers because the water markets have contracted. Earlier, under a flat tariff regime, there was more informal buying and selling of groundwater. And these parts don't have a water scarcity. To so actually buying and selling of water services is good. 
so i think that uh, there is still a scope for um, for these stand alone off grid farms in these kind of very very water abundant areas because what they really have is a free marginal cost of water and they can then actually service a larger number of poor people who can buy water from these farms and these are clean and, and let's not take out our eyes away from the decarbonization agenda i mean all of us have to eventually decarbonize in, in any which whichsoever form yeah i i i'll stop there so basically we have to think differently for water abundant and water scarce yes yeah, certainly certainly and um, uh, yeah let, let me shift the discussion a little from the uh, solar part uh, and go to priya uh, you, you have been thinking about the technology option so now we are sort of seeing a technological change which is uh, going to affect agriculture it may be slow it may be delayed but uh, this uh, either through pumps or through grid connect the grid scale solar but the the source of energy is going to change in agriculture and rural areas how can you use this opportunity to promote uh, any um, any economic activity uh, which which can sort of um, help the farmers build their capacity as you said so what are what, what are the scope here i mean is there any scope or we let the farmers um, do farming and think of industrialization and manufacturing only i i, I think that if we want to i think the farmer should certainly be at the focus of everything we think about i mean in this aspect so you yeah. want the farmer to be resilient you want it to be uh, sustainable and have a livelihood you know you want these yeah. things now the source of energy um, i mean if the farmers are going to be so irrigation access is a very important thing especially with climate change and uh, like for in places like maharashtra which are many uh, areas are rain fed many marginal farmers just needs a little bit of protective irrigation you know to make make a big difference so they need two or three irrigations in the season maybe and those marginal farmers are the ones who get left out in a constrained system so if your energy constraint for whatever reason you know there are long wait times for getting grid connections uh, there are problems with electricity supply four days a week it's night time supply which makes it really hard for farmers so and the marginal farmers are the ones who will suffer the most so definitely you want to focus on that um, on them and do something for them now changing the energy source like i said as far as i can see see off grid pumps are especially in a place like maharashtra are economically unviable and especially for marginal farmers because they are just going to use it a few times in the year or few or days in the year now to improve uh, i mean so so now if you're talking about grid connected then your source of energy doesn't really make a difference to the final to the farmer you know yes you want daytime supply that's true but beyond that i don't think that the source of energy makes a difference and uh, but there are many things that can be done to improve quality of supply to farmers which are uh, you know which are economical which are uh, very feasible and which can be done which really need to be done and i think that these are the reasons we need to keep the focus on what are the true technical solutions which are going to help the farmer i i think we need to keep our eye on that so climate change may be a big it is a big deal but climate change and helping farmers don't have to not go together however the answer may not be solarization uh secondly now one of the things that i think we need to do for the farmers though is to they need to there needs to be local capacity building and a community um, kind of an approach so for for instance the water budgeting is a approach that many are considering you know many foundations many experts scientists also uh, promoting the water budget approach which is that a village gets so much water in a season and that's what the cropping the, the cropping that's done should uh, utilize that water and no more and there needs to be equity in that so villagers need to essentially get together and um, you know solve their problems and that that's what some of these uh, you know ideal villages have uh, that's the approach some of these ideal vill villages like kopatra pawars or uh, raigaon siddhi have used that the villagers come together 
that's something that can also be used in energy in some sense you know there are community approaches where farmers on one distribution transformer get together and schedule the access and usage that's really optimizing usage of resources and uh, for that we need a lot of capacity building at the local level at the say at the krishi office or the more responsibility to the local subdivision office for the electricity uh, for the distribution sector but we do need to do a lot of local capacity building at the institutional level as well as helping the farmers yeah thanks thanks priya let, let, let me ask the same question to haris uh, i mean uh, haris i agree that uh, we don't want to overburden uh, the farmers but at the same time uh, we understand that the farm sector is in a crisis and uh, um, maybe this year farm has done well in terms of economy what you, you have explained to us uh, but um, uh, uh, what i'm basically asking is now that this uh, energy transition is happening i mean whether we whatever the mode may be be it uh, subsidized pumps solar systems to farmers or be it solarization of the larger grid itself so that's going to happen so can we leverage to bring in some changes in rural area that helps the farmer uh, or uh, um, uh, sort of manufacturing led uh, growth is the uh, is the trajectory we have to follow uh, um, so I, i'm i'm thinking of what could be the alternative for rural india haris over okay. uh, you are on mute haris It was in Jhansi, Mahoba, you know, the Bundelkhand belt. This was sometime in, in 2017, December. Okay. This was a real drought year. Okay. And there I saw a few patches of green, you know, in a, in a complete sort of a barren landscape. And there I saw many farmers, you know, they had farm ponds, you know. I think, I think farm ponds would be a very good uh, 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 a start, you know. Let, let farmers be able to store uh, 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 the, the, the rainwater. Like this time, Bundelkhand has had a lot of floods, I mean, in the last uh, few days, if you see. So, if the, so and, and what is happening is because of this, you know, more and more, it is the rabi crop which is becoming more predictable because the uh, curry you just cannot plan you know so so uh, so if you have a way of storing the 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 the, the, the rainwater okay uh, uh, through farm ponds now how you extract that water whether you are doing it through solar whether you are doing it through 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 electricity it doesn't matter for me it doesn't make make a difference uh, how how that is being used you know so but 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 maybe with 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 with, with that stored rainwater if you are able to you know take out about say two irrigations two irrigations three irrigations then you can grow a good pulses crop so the first stage would be say say having having a farm pond the next stage would be say maybe sprinkler or drip irrigation you know so 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 with the same uh, this thing instead of two irrigations i can give four irrigations right if you if you if you give the farmer the flexibility for four irrigations he might uh, switch over from say pulses to wheat okay which may not be the right uh, 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 kind of uh, incentive but uh, overall i still believe i mean from whatever i've seen of solar pumps that these will work only in areas where the water table is relatively low you know and 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 and, and i would say that let this technology stabilize you know and and once farmers feel confident about this solar this thing i am telling you they themselves will start asking you know the next stage after that will be you know i think farm cold storage you know they'll say that hey come on i have i have taken out so many uh, 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 vegetables can i store it on my farm you know according to me that also is is something uh, is, is is a very big uh, uh, movement you know if if, if i am able to say store about say 2 tons 3 tons right i mean uh, and and i am able to you know sell sell this uh, 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 
in in a staggered way. So I think we should look at it uh, step by step. You know, see, shock treatment Sorry. can never work in agriculture. You know, it 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 cannot. Sure. You know, in rural areas. And and I am personally against any shock treatment, especially after you know demonetization, GST, lockdown. You know, all these kind of things. Let us not yeah. give too many shocks. You know, and and I am telling you, this thirty rupees increase in diesel prices in the last one year. That itself is going to unleash a lot of this thing. In fact. I think today probably when it comes to diesel, yeah. you don't need probably a subsidy of uh, whatever ninety percent for solar pumps. I think I think the farmers will automatically switch over wherever there is no electric yeah. connection. They will switch over to uh, uh, to to this, you know. So so that's what I think. Yeah. And and electricity consumption will increase in rural areas, whether we like it or not. You know, whether that will yeah. lead to deep whatever carbon or uh, something. Uh, more and more electricity is going to be consumed. See, and, and for many industries, you need three-phase power, right? I mean, so 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 yeah. let us not kid ourselves. Let us keep our goals yeah. modest. You know, let us let us work on irrigation and maybe yeah. cold storage. Next stage, I don't know. Maybe it can yes. come. Let technology evolve. Yeah. Uh, thanks, Aris. Uh, thanks for bringing up that point. And. Um, uh first thing i would like to mention that uh, i think solar is um, stabilized uh, we we have uh, in terms of cost in terms of technology mm -hmm. it's close to stabilized uh, so that's that's a point i wanted to make and thanks for bringing up the point on irrigation in fact um, you sort of you were disconnected at that point but the first suggestion we are making is we need to club a solarization with uh, efficient irrigation infrastructure and uh, which uh, not only means uh, drip and sprinkler but also water conservation the things you pointed out whether we how we can conserve rainwater and use in other seasons so those those are the first step actually promoting economic activity is the next step and little long run and the third point i wanted to make is uh, by thinking about this, we, we uh, the point of thinking now is we can think of an action plan five years down the line, and by the time the things get implemented, it takes more time. It's not like we're going to give a shock treatment next year. So uh, I'll stop there and uh, go to Ashwin now. Um, uh, on uh, uh, one of the things we find difficult is coordinating at the ground level. Uh, I mean, particularly if we think of this sort of arrangement, uh, it's going to be much more uh, interdepartmental coordination. And by uh, looking at solar filter, particularly, you have been trying to probably engage with uh, different departments within the electricity sector, uh, different agencies, particularly. So, what's your thought on that? Uh, uh, and uh, if we want to add one more layer to that, uh, how complicated it will be, and we are running out of time. So yeah, if yeah. we press once before we wind I, up, I'll give you a very short answer. Actually, we didn't coordinate with too many departments at all. It was only the electricity department. There is a bigger reason, and that also you need to keep it simple as well. I think I cannot okay. emphasize this enough that mm -hmm. uh, I agree with many of what my co-panelists have said, but I disagree with some of it as well. I think by uh, expecting too much out of one we will definitely lose out on the benefit of what at least solar can provide. Uh, we, uh, in the Maharashtra scheme, in the first instance, uh, with solar, they wanted to do 100% metering, um, you know, many other things. And they quickly realized in a year, nothing moved ahead. Uh, I, I completely agree with Harish. You need to keep it simple and not burden the farmer with many more things. That is why the solar feeder scheme is there is no change in price. There's no change in cropping pattern. There's nothing changed to begin with. Once you build trust, let them get used to two, uh, one or two years of reliable daytime power. Then you can engage with them and say, why don't you do cold storage? Why don't you do drip irrigation? Why can't you do X, Y, and Z? Uh, it, it is not just... You know, we, we know what is to be done. It's how will you get it done in the political economy that, you know, has, uh, you know, entrenched interest. So, uh, you know, I, I may end on a slightly different note, but I think, you know, trying to uh, save everything. You, you know, uh, I want to save water, I want to give income to farmers, I want to save climate. You can't do everything with one solution. Uh, even if you move the needle a bit and it moves ahead and it's in the right direction, I think that is what... And a lot of this discussion could be moved because most of the states are strongly and very quickly moving into 
universalization of the solar feeder scheme so the solar pump off grid model is limited to 2% of or 3% of ag you know agriculture irrigation uh, so the comparison with diesel yes but you have 90% capital subsidies whereas for solar feeders there are no absolutely you know very little maharashtra has had, its own policy has no incentives or subsidies from the government and given where we are on tax collection as a nation it is very unlikely that you will get those kinds of capital subsidies going forward just today government has stopped the capital subsidies for rooftop solar so you could expect yeah. that on solar pumps as well so i think we need to be realistic and see where the states have already moved so you know i know okay. it's close to move, ending time so i'll, I'll stop you yeah. thanks thanks justin and um, we are sort of running out of time uh, and it's um, and thanks for engaging with this uh, discussion and this is very insightful and i appreciate the pushbacks as well we'll think harder and we'll hopefully have further discussion on this um, the one last point i wanted to make uh, the uh, concerns raised by ashwin at the end and everybody for the discussion they all are equally important i mean we need to work on all the aspects of it and i don't know how to uh, whether we combine it or we treat them individually we'll we'll discuss it further in next session so i thank everyone all the audience and uh, all the panelists for joining and engaging with the discussion thank you thank you thanks ashwin bye ashwin. bye thanks yeah. bye. Yes. Thank thanks you. so bye. much bye